Welcome to the course Radio Frequency Integrated Circuits and Systems. My name is Payam Haydari and I'm the University Chancellor's Professor at the University of California, Irvine. The sec second topic which I'm going to cover in this course is on fundamentals of communication systems. I will first go over modulation and the benefits that a modulation scheme uh, can introduce in general to a communication link. Then I will look at the bandpass representation of signals in a wireless uh, communication system and look at the quadrature representation. Then we'll uh, switch my attention to basic continuous wave analog modulations. That includes amplitude modulation or AM, phase modulation or PM, and frequency modulation or FM. I will also look at the concept of narrowband FM and PM and go over some analytical study of FM, narrowband FM and PM schemes. Then I will look at the baseband digital transmission and related to the baseband digital transmission, uh, we will go over the definition of intersymbol interference or ISI in a um, digital transmitter and receiver uh, platform. And then I will introduce I diagram as a very good performance parameter that is used to evaluate and assess the amount of ISI. Then I will look at the pulse shaping method as a powerful technique uh, to improve the ISI in a communication link. Then I will look at basic digital modulation schemes, which includes phase shifting or PSK and quadrature amplitude modulation or QAM. And finally, I will study the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing or OFDM as a powerful multi-carrier scheme to improve the, uh, the bit rate and capacity in a communication system. Modulation and coding are two important operations performed on the transmitter side in order to achieve efficient and reliable information transmission. These two operations, and in particular modulation and modulation, are so essential uh, that uh, I'm going to explain and go through the essential uh, aspect and principle of uh, the modulation demodulation. In fact, understanding of modulation demodulation will help us better understand uh, the operation and the structures of radio frequency transmitters and receivers. Okay, so let's start with the modulation methods. Fundamentally, modulation involves two waveform, a modulating signal this modulating signal is uh, normally contain, uh, containing information, basic information, uh, the message, for example, and the carrier wave. And a modulator systematically alters the carrier wave attributes, for example, its frequency, phase, or magnitude uh, in correspondence with the variations of the modulating signal. Looking at the modulation, different types of modulation, we can group the modulations into two major groups. Uh, continuous wave analog modulation. Two major classes that are widely used within this uh, continuous wave analog modulations are uh, double sideband amplitude modulation and the phase and frequency modulation. Within the double sideband amplitude modulation, there are two major sub-blocks or modulation schemes, which I'm going to explain also uh, in, 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 in this course, uh, the amplitude modulation or AM and the SVSC or uh, double sideband uh, single carrier modulation. For, as for the phase and frequency modulation, there are two widely used modulation schemes here, a frequency modulated signal or FM and a phase modulated signal PM. I'm going to explain FM and, the, uh, the, the FM and PM systems and in particular uh, focus our attention uh, to narrowband FM and PM operation. The digital modulation is a scheme that is widely used in modern transmitters and receivers. Uh, to, uh, I, will, uh, I will start looking at the basic modulation scheme and we will go through the uh, operation of on-off king or OK phase shifting or PSK, and the frequency sh shift king or FSK. Then uh, after understanding the basic modulation schemes, then I, I, we will look at the spectrally efficient modulation, si modulation schemes, for example, Emery phase shift king or Emery PSK, and Emery quadrature amplitude modulation or uh, Emery, qu uh, Emery QAM. And I will explain the uh, advantages and the disadvantages of each and every one of these modulation schemes.
Chronologically, the analog continuous wave modulation or CW modulation uh, it has come and invented being used before the, the digital modulation scheme. And therefore, I will uh, first explain the analog CW modulation and then switch our attention to the digital modulation scheme. Okay, so uh, in order to better understand the analog continuous wave modulation, let's look at the vocal uh, system of a human being. The major organs within a vocal system of a human being are uh, comprised of uh, lips, nasal cavity, shown here, oral cavity, and uh, the vocal cord, okay? So, uh, as we speak, we will act as a continuous wave modulator. But why this is the case? In order to kind of prove that, you know, our speaking mechanism is really acting like a continuous wave modulation, let's look at the way that the voice is processed and produced. First of all, uh, we will see that vocal cord, vocal cords here, are responsible for uh, generation of sound and speech. In fact, uh, the vocal cord or vocal, co vocal fold opens closes and vibrates as the air passes, to, passes through it in order to create sound and speech. Once the sound is uh, generated, it's going to be modulated by the muscular actions of the oral and sometimes nasal cavity. So the voice is produced uh, by the air pressure passing through the vocal cord. And once the voice is produced, then it's going to be modulated by the uh, muscular actions of the oral or nasal cavity. What we hear, in fact, is the modulated acoustic wave similar to an AM signal. The primary purpose of modulation is to generate modulated signal that is suited to the characteristic of a transmitted channel. And then bringing this signal, this, uh, bringing, bringing this signal, transferring this signal to uh, often higher frequencies in order to make sure that the components being used within the transmitter or receiver are small sized or in a manageable size, I would say. All right, as I stated uh, in the previous slides, the primary purpose of modulation in the communication system is to generate a modulated signal which is suited to the characteristics of a particular transmission channel. Actually, there are some other benefits and properties of the modulation, which I'm going to explain in the next uh, few slides. The very first benefit of the modulation is in regard to efficient transmission. Signal transmission over appreciable distance always involves a traveling uh, electromagnetic wave. So this is a very important notion. The efficiency of such transmission always depends on the frequency of the signal, which is being transmitted through the channel. Now, if that is the case, in other words, if the efficiency is really determined by the frequency of the signal being transmitted, then uh, we can basically take advantage of the continuous wave modulation. And by exploiting the frequency translation property of the continuous wave modulation, we can basically translate the information frequency uh, to a, um, and put it around a carrier whose frequency is selected to achieve the desired transmission, okay? So this is uh, kind of the way it goes. Another very important property of the uh, modulation or the advantage of the modulation is uh, lying on its frequency translation uh, task that basically reduces the effective footprint of the passive components within a transmitter receiver. What does it mean? It means that uh, the notion that we, uh, the modulation allows us to do the frequency translation of the uh, signal, message signal, to another frequency helps us reduce the effective uh, antenna size uh, uh, for, uh, for, that particular, uh, for, the, for that particular transmission method. Consider, for example, an unmodulated, trans um, unmodulated signal uh, with a bandwidth of around one kilohertz. So let's assume that we have a signal of around one kilohertz bandwidth, right? Okay, one kilohertz. And let's assume that we put, we, we place this signal uh, around the DC frequency, okay? So we place the signal around the DC frequency. The antenna size that is, new, that is needed to basically um, uh, facilitate this transmission is around 
150 kilometer. So the antenna size is extremely big. Now let's assume that I take this signal, right? And then I, play, I take the signal and then I um, up convert it to a carrier frequency, right? By multiplying it with a cosine function, for example. Then what happens is that in the frequency domain, as we remember, uh, what we can generate is um, a copy of this uh, spectrum, which is centered around the carrier frequency. Now, if the carrier frequency, let's say, rather than uh, one kilohertz, right, the, the, carrier frequency, the, the carrier frequency is uh, 10 gigahertz, right? With the same bandwidth, then we see that um, the an effective antenna footprint for this transmission is only 1.5 centimeter. Compare 1.5 centimeter with 100, uh, 150 kilometer of antenna size. So the frequency translation portion of the modulation helps drastically reduce the um, antenna and in general passive footprint uh, in a transmitter and a receiver. Another very important benefit of the modulation is its ability to overcome the hardware limitation. For the most part, the design of a communication system is always constrained by the cost. The cost is pretty much influenced by the hardware cost. And the hardware cost is, uh, uh, and the hardware performance depends on the frequency of operation. A particular concern along this line of thought is the question of the fractional bandwidth. So what is a fractional bandwidth? Uh, the fractional bandwidth, according to definition, is the absolute bandwidth over the center frequency. So if you have a center frequency of, let's say, 10 gigahertz, and then we have a bandwidth of 1 gigahertz, then the fractional bandwidth is only 10%. Hardware costs and uh, related comp uh, complications can be minimized if the fractional bandwidth is kept below 10%. Therefore, if you want to increase, uh, if you want to uh, design uh, systems, we have to pay attention to the fact that a wideband uh, circuit, integrated circuit, a wideband uh, radio transmitter receiver, uh, not only is uh, very uh, difficult to design, but uh, also is very costly. It likewise follows that the signals with large bandwidth should be modulated on high carrier frequencies, and that is also related to the data rate. The data rate, how high the data rate or information rate uh, is, and how high uh, of a data rate a transmitter and receiver can, um, f can uh, handle, is really dependent on the information bandwidth. Uh, and this can be easily uh, this relationship can easily be obtained through the channel theory. So we conclude that if uh, we are looking or we are seeking application with high information uh, rate or high bit rate, then in order to keep the fractional bandwidth below 10%, we have to use a high carrier frequency. For example, a 5 gigahertz wireless transceiver can effectively accommodate 1,000 times as much information in a given time interval as uh, one megahertz radio channel. So therefore, going toward uh, higher frequencies, modulation and frequency translation uh, helps uh, keep the cost of the hardware as low as, as low as possible. Another important benefit of modulation lies in the frequency and channel assignment. Tuning a radio or TV set to a particular uh, station selects effectively one of many signals being received. Each station has a different assigned carrier frequency, and if that's the case, then the desired signal can be separated from others by filtering. Now, were it not for the modulation, we could only have one station uh, that could broadcast in a given area because two or more broadcasting, if we wanted to use two or more broadcasting uh, stations, we had to deal with a hopeless amount of interference. Therefore, um, the modulation helps uh, allocate multiple uh, frequency channels side by side with minimum amount of interference, thereby uh, allowing uh, the multiple access to multiple channels uh, in, a given, in, in a given band. And finally, the um, other uh, advantage of modulation is on multiplexing. Multiplexing is in fact uh, the process of combining several signals for simultaneous transmission over one channel. The way it goes, the, the multiplexing can be done in two different ways. Frequency division multiplexing or FDM, 
or time division multiplexing or TDM. Frequency multi division multiplexing is shown here, and one example of TDM is shown here. In the frequency division multiplexing, we basically use continuous wave uh, modu modulation to put each signal on a different carrier frequency, and as a result, uh, lining up different subbands next to each other in order to create this kind of multi-signal or multi-carrier uh, transmission and reception. Time division multiplexing, on the other hand, uses pulse modulation to put samples of different signals uh, next to each other in non-overlapping time slots, as shown here. Okay. For instance, the gaps between the pulses. So if you have pulses, for example, representing each signal or each channel, um, then the gaps between the pulses can be used to uh, fill in the samples from the other signals. By doing this, we can line up the signals from uh, different channels on one single line, and as a result, using time division multiplexing, we can send different signals, different sub-channels on the single uh, line or single channel.